Shalom Israel, it's Kazawan, and the name of this video is Hidden Israelite Strangers. I chose that title because a lot of times we see the word stranger in the Bible and we might think it's talking about the other nations, but it's actually talking about Israelites. So in this video, I want to show you how the word stranger is used in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. This is important because this will help you get a better understanding of how the Most High looks at things as opposed to how we look at things sometimes. What you have to remember when you're studying is that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Now, there are nine different Hebrew words for stranger in the Old Testament. Each one of these words are translated as stranger in English, but they all have slightly different meanings. So it's not as simple as it might seem when it comes to understanding the word stranger. Now you have some people who say Israelites were never called strangers in the Bible. And then you have some who say a stranger can be an Israelite, but only if that word stranger is the Hebrew word gar. Number 1616 in the concordance. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is Exodus 2 and 21. It says, And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. Verse 22. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now, for those people who say Israelites were never called strangers in the Bible, this one verse cancels that ideal because Moses was an Israelite and he called himself a stranger in this verse. So we don't have to even deal with that anymore. Now, Moses said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And when you look the word stranger up in this verse, you see that it's number 1616 and it's the Hebrew word gar. So we see that gar is used to describe an Israelite stranger, but it's not the only one. And it's very important that we understand that because if we say that the Hebrew word gar is the only word that describes Israelite strangers, then our understanding of a lot of scriptures is going to be wrong. And I'm going to show you that in this video. Now, the main two Hebrew words for stranger that we're going to deal with is Zawar and Nakaria. So here we go. Jeremiah 51 and 49. It says, As Babylon have caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. So this is talking about the Babylonians when they invaded the land of Israel. Now watch this. Verse 51. This is how the Israelites felt. It says, We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame have covered our faces for strangers are come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. Now, we know that the strangers in this verse is talking about the Babylonians. Now, when you look up the word strangers in this verse, it's number 2114, and it's the Hebrew word zawar. So we see that the word zawar is used to describe the other nations as strangers. Now, does that mean that the Hebrew word zawar can't be used for an Israelite? Let's see. Psalms 54 and 1. It says, To the chief musician on Neganoth, Mashiel, a psalm of David, when the Zipphims came and said to Saul, Doth not David hide himself with us? Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Verse 2. This is David praying to the Most High. It says, Hear my prayer, O God. 
Give ear to the words of my mouth. Verse 3, here it is. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. So David said, strangers are risen up against me. Now, when you look the word strangers up in this verse, it's number 2114, and it's the Hebrew word zawar. Now, verse 1 tells us that these strangers are the Zithims that came and said to Saul, Doth not David hide himself with us? So let's go to the verse when this actually happened. 1 Samuel 23 and 19. It says, Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us? So we see that these Ziphites told Saul where David was at. So who are these Ziphites? Let's go up to verse 14. It says, And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. So David was in the wilderness of Ziph, the land that belonged to the Ziphites. Now watch this. When you look up the word Ziph in this verse, it says Ziph, and it means battlement. Number one, a son of Jehalalel, a descendant of Judah. So the Ziphites came from a man named Ziph who was a descendant of Judah. So Ziph was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah, which means the Ziphites were from the tribe of Judah also, the same tribe where David came from. So when you go back to Psalms 54 and 3, and David said, strangers are risen up against me, he's talking about Israelites from his own tribe. He called them strangers. Zawar, number 2114. The same word and number used to describe the Babylonians in Jeremiah 51 and 51. So wait a minute. The Ziphims are Israelites. So why did David call them Zawar strangers instead of Gar strangers? Because Gar is not the only Hebrew word used to describe Israelite strangers. It's not that simple. See, it all depends on the situation of the people and the context of the verse. David called the Ziphims Zawar strangers because even though they were from his own tribe, they were treating David like they didn't know him. That's why David said this in Psalm 69 and 8. It says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren. See, David said he was a stranger to his own brethren. And when you look the word stranger up in this verse, you see that it's number 2114 and it's the Hebrew word zawar. So let's get some understanding. The Hebrew word zawar is used to describe an enemy as well as someone who is estranged or alienated from someone else. For example, the Zithims was supposed to have love for David because David was their brethren. But instead, they turned their backs on David. So David called them strangers, Zawar, because they had become his enemies. Now, the word Zawar is also used to describe anybody that's in another person's position or in a place that they shouldn't be in. That's why when you look it up, you see that it says another. It's talking about someone doing something other than the person you expect to be doing it. For example, if you walk into a car dealership to buy a car, and a pizza delivery man comes out in his uniform 
trying to sell you a car, that's a Zawar stranger. Because the person that you expect to be in the position is replaced by someone else. Now, let me give you a biblical example. Earlier, we read Jeremiah 51 and 51. The Babylonians were called Zawar strangers because they came inside the sanctuaries where the Israelites dwelt at. See, anybody that came into the sanctuaries that was not an Israelite was considered a Zawar, a stranger. It's just like the pizza guy in the car dealership trying to sell cars. He's in the wrong place and in the wrong position. Now, I'm going to show you that the Most High uses the Hebrew word Zawar in the same way that I just explained. Look at this. Numbers 1 and 50. This is the Most High talking to Moses. It says, But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all things that belong to it. They, the Levites, they shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. So according to verse 50, the Levites were appointed to handle the tabernacle and everything that pertained to it. And the Levites had to set up their tents around the tabernacle. Verse 51. And when the tabernacle set it forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. Now watch this. It says, And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Now, when you look the word stranger up in this verse, again, it's the Hebrew word zawar. So the Most High said that the zawar stranger that comes close to the tabernacle shall be put to death. Now, somebody might read this verse and think this stranger is talking about the other nations, but it's not. This stranger is any Israelite that is not a Levite. Let me show you. At the end of verse 50, it says the Levites had to set up their tents or their camp around the tabernacle. Now, where did the other Israelites have to set up their tents at? Verse 52, it says, And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their host, which means the other Israelite tribes could not set their tents up around the tabernacle. They had to set their tents up away from the tabernacle. Look at this. Numbers 2 and 2. It says, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Here it is. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. See, the other tribes had to set their tents up far off, away from the tabernacle. But watch this. Let's go back to Numbers 1 and 53. It says, But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony. Why? It says that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of testimony. So the point that the Most High was making is this. The only people he wanted dealing with the tabernacle was the Levites. Any other Israelite was a stranger. Not that the Most High didn't know them, but they were a stranger to that position. And if he saw an Israelite that wasn't a Levite dealing with the tabernacle, it says 
his wrath would come upon the whole congregation of the children of Israel. See, the Levites were specifically chosen to do that job. So if another Israelite tried to step into that position, the Most High would look at him strange like, what are you doing? You're in the wrong position. You're a stranger, a zawar. So as you can see, understanding the word stranger is not so cut and dry. Now the next Hebrew word for stranger that I want to deal with is the word Nakaria, number 5237 in the concordance. Now this is the Hebrew word for stranger that causes the most problems when studying. In most cases, this word is used to describe the other nations as strangers. Let me give you an example. Deuteronomy 17 verse 15, it says, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So we know the word stranger in this verse is talking about the other nations. Now, when you look up the word stranger in this verse, it's number 5237, and it's the Hebrew word nakaria. So the word nakaria is used to describe the other nations as strangers. But again, it can also be used to describe an Israelite, and we're going to prove it. Now, a while back, I did a video called Ruth the Israelite, showing through the scriptures that Ruth was an Israelite. But some people didn't agree because Ruth said she was a Nakaya. Let's look at that verse. Ruth 2 and 10, it says, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Now, when you look the word stranger up in this verse, it's the Hebrew word, nakaria. But again, it's not that simple. You can't just go by a certain Hebrew word and a certain concordance number. We proved that already with the Hebrew word, zawar. See, the Most High and the people in the Bible, they use the same words in multiple ways, just like we do with English words. For example, if I say the stove is hot, that means the stove can actually burn me if I touch it. But if I say that song is hot, does that mean that the song can actually burn me? No. It means that the song is a really good song. I could also say, that brother was upset. He was hot, meaning he was really angry. Now, I used the same word hot three times, but it had three different meanings. Well, the same rules apply in the Hebrew. The word nakaria has multiple meanings. It can be used to describe a person without having anything to do with their actual nationality. And we're going to prove it right now. Proverbs 2 and 16. It says, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now, when you look up the word stranger in this verse, it's number 5237, and it's the Hebrew word, nakaria. So this strange woman in verse 16 is called a nakaria. Let's see what her nationality is. Verse 17, it says, Which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Now, wait a minute. It says this woman forsaketh the guide of her youth 
and forgetteth the covenant of her God. So who are the people that the Most High gave his covenant to? Romans 9 and 4, it says, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants? So we see that the covenants were given to the Israelites. So this woman in Proverbs 2 and 17 that forgot the covenant of her God is an Israelite woman who turned away from the laws, statutes, and commandments. So the Most High looked at her as a Nakaria, a stranger. See, her being called a Nakaria had nothing to do with her actual nationality because this woman is an Israelite. Now, when you look at verse 16, it says, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. So this is talking about an Israelite woman who talks real smooth and real slick. Now, when you go to chapter 5, verse 3, it's talking about the same type of Israelite woman. It says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Meaning she talks real smooth and she says all the right things. Let's jump down to verse 20. Watch this. It says, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? Meaning, why would you allow yourself to be led astray by a woman like this? Remember, this is an Israelite woman that doesn't keep the commandments. It says, and embrace the bosom of a stranger. Now, when you look up this word stranger, it's Nakaria. Again, we see this word being used in a way that has nothing to do with nationality. This is an Israelite woman. See, it's all about the context of the verse. Now, let me show you another way that Nakaria is used. We read this verse earlier, but I was waiting to get to this part to explain it. This is King David talking. Psalm 69 and 8. It says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren. That stranger is Zoar. But watch this. It says, and an alien Unto my mother's children. Now, when you look the word alien up in this verse, it's the Hebrew word Nakaria. So David said he became a Nakaria to his mother's children. Why? In the beginning of the verse, David said, I am become a stranger unto my brethren, a Zawar, meaning. They were treating David like he didn't belong around them. And because they were treating David that way, he said, I've become a Nakaria to my mother's children. Meaning, they were treating David like he was a foreigner. The word Nakaria is not wrong in this verse. It's supposed to be there because that's how David felt when he said it. He felt like a foreigner because his own people were treating him like they didn't know him. So here we have King David saying he's a Nakaria. Now, does that mean that David was not an Israelite? No. Again, it's all about the context of the verse. Now, just in case somebody still thinks that the word Nakaria should not have been used for David, Watch this. Job 19 and 14. This is Job talking. It says, My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. So Job said his own family and friends wasn't dealing with them anymore. Verse 15. It says, They that dwell in mine house 
and my maids count me for a stranger. That stranger is Zawar. The people in Job's house was acting like Job was out of place in his own house. But it got so bad, in the next part, Job said, I am an alien in their sight. When you look the word alien up in this verse, it's the Hebrew word nakaria. Job said he was a nakaria in the sight of his own family and friends, meaning his own family was looking at Job like he was a foreigner. Now, this is the same thing that David said about his brethren in Psalm 69 and 8. Let me put it under this verse so that you can see it. Job and David said that they were Nakaria to their own people. Not only did they treat Job different, he actually looked different because of the sickness he was going through. Job 2 and 7 says that Job's whole body was covered in boils from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Again, the word Nakaria doesn't just deal with nationality. It also means something unknown or unfamiliar. That's how Ruth used the word Nakaria. She used it in the sense of being unknown or unfamiliar to Boaz. Ruth had just come from another land. She didn't know anybody in the land of Judah. Boaz saw Ruth in the field with all the other women, and this is what happened. Ruth 2 and 10, it says, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger, a Nakaria. But this has nothing to do with her nationality. She's talking about the fact that Boaz was being extra nice to her and he didn't even know her. She was a foreigner, meaning she was unknown and unfamiliar to the people in the land of Judah. See, words have more than one meaning. The word foreigner is complex within itself. For example, if you have an Israelite who grew up in America and an Israelite who grew up in Brazil, both of those Israelites would be foreigners in the other person's country. But that doesn't mean that they're not both Israelites. Again, it's all about the context. Now, so far in this video, we saw several cases of the word Nakaria being used when it had nothing to do with nationality. We saw Job say that he was a Nakaria to his own people. We even saw King David say that he was a Nakaria to his own people. And there are other examples that I didn't show you for time purposes. So the fact that Ruth said she was a Nakaria does not prove that she was not an Israelite. We also saw the Israelite women in Proverbs being called Nakaria. See, when you really get down to it, at one point, the whole nation of Israel became Nakaria strangers to the Most High. He had mercy on us, but he still referred to the whole nation as Nakaria at one point. Look at this. Jeremiah 2 and 14, it says, Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? So we see that the Most High is talking about Israel. Let's go down to verse 20. It says, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, I will not transgress. Meaning, every time you get in trouble, Israel, I come to your rescue and you say, I'm not going to sin anymore. It says, When upon every high hill and under every green tree, thou wanderest playing the harlot. In other words, you say you're not going to sin anymore, but you constantly turn to wickedness and idols. 
verse 21, it says, Yet I planted thee a noble vine. I made you a great people. Holy, a right seed. You produced kings, prophets, and great men. It says, How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Meaning, how did you become such a rebellious people? Now we see that the Most High said Israel turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine. And when you look up the word strange in this verse, it's the Hebrew word nakarya. So the Most High said that Israel as a nation became nakarya, strangers unto him. So how can someone have a problem with an Israelite being called a nakarya? When the Most High said the whole nation of Israel became Nakaria strangers to him. See, I'm just showing you how the word is used in several different ways. This is totally different from the way that David used the word Nakaria for himself because David wasn't doing wickedness when he said it. But here in Jeremiah 2 and 21, the Most High is using the word Nakaria to describe Israelites that turned away from him to do wickedness. Just like the wicked Israelite women in Proverbs who turned away from the commandments. So you can't just see the word stranger and assume that it's talking about the other nations. And for those of us that go into the Hebrew, just because it's not a certain Hebrew word or a certain concordance number, that does not mean that it's not an Israelite. See, there's no one Hebrew word and one concordance number that covers all Israelite strangers. We just saw that in this video. Here's the thing. The Strong's concordance is good to use as a study tool, but it's not the end-all, be-all answer to everything. All the concordance does is match numbers to Hebrew words so that you can find them and get a basic idea of how those words are used in the Bible. Let me show you this. This is what it says about the Strong's Concordance in Wikipedia. It says, Strong's Concordance is not a translation of the Bible, nor is it intended as a translation tool. The use of Strong's numbers is not a substitute for professional translation of the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into English by those with formal training in ancient languages and the literature of the cultures in which the Bible was written. Now watch this. It says, Since Strong's Concordance identifies the original words in Hebrew and Greek, Strong's numbers are sometimes misinterpreted by those without adequate training to change the Bible from its accurate meaning simply by taking the words out of cultural context. See, this is what I've been saying. Watch this. It says, the use of Strong's numbers does not consider figures of speech, metaphors, idioms, common phrases, cultural references, references to historical events, or alternate meanings used by those of the time period to express their thoughts in their own language at the time. See, there are alternate meanings of the words based on the time and the context that it was written in. And when you look at these words in the concordance and the numbers assigned to them, that's just a basic mapping system. So even though you might see a certain Hebrew word and a certain concordance number, you have to dig deeper to get the proper understanding. So don't give the concordance authority over the scriptures. 
It's supposed to be the other way around. Romans 8 and 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit, not by the concordance, for as many as are led by the Spirit of the Most High, they are the sons of the Most High. So yes, we can use the concordance, but it's our obligation as the people of the Most High to search out these scriptures and see what they really mean. And that's pretty much it. So I hope somebody got some understanding from this video. And with that, I say, Shalom.